Be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Lord Jesus, Most High, you are without beginning or end, and beyond our understanding. Your angel was sent to righteous Joseph to dispel all his fear. Now confirm us in your truth, and make us worthy of your salvation. Keep us from doubt and protect our faith, that we may profess your miraculous birth and honor your pure mother Mary and righteous Joseph. We raise glory and thanks to you, to your Father and to your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Peace be with the church and her children. Let us raise glory, honor, and praise to God the Father who sent his angel in a dream to righteous Joseph, and to the glorious Son who dwelt in the womb of the pure Virgin, and to the Holy Spirit who revealed the mystery of the Holy Virgin's conception. To the good one be glory and honor on this feast in all the days of our lives and forever. Glory be to you, O Christ our God, you chose the most blessed among women to be your mother, and in a dream you revealed the mystery of your conception to righteous Joseph, to whom she had been betrothed, filling him with all peace. Today we celebrate the feast of your divine revelation, the divine revelation that Joseph received dispelling his fear the divine revelation that filled all believers with joy, the divine revelation that removed every doubt from Joseph regarding the purest of virgins. Now, O Lord, we implore you through the prayers of Mary, your mother, and Joseph, your chosen one, and with the fragrance of this incense, that the celebration of this feast be for our salvation. Sanctify sinners and dispel all doubt and fear. Bring back those who are far and protect those who are near. May joy and peace fill the world and love and unity dwell within our hearts. May the departed find rest in your heavenly kingdom and we raise glory and thanks to you, to your Father and to your Holy Spirit forever.
O Lord, you are the sweet fragrance who fills the whole world. You remove fear from Joseph's heart and confirm the truth about Mary's conception. Accept our incense and fill our souls with joy and grant rest to all the departed, that we may raise glory and thanks to you now and forever. Amen. Fear, son of David, send the angel in a dream. For the child Mary carries is the Son of God Most High. reading from the letter of St. Paul to the Ephesians. Glory to the Lord of Paul and the Apostles. May the mercy of God descend upon the reader, the listeners, and upon this parish and her children forever. Brothers and sisters, because of this, I, Paul, a prisoner for Christ, Jesus, for you Gentiles, if I suppose you have heard of the stewardship of God's grace that was given to me for your benefit, namely, that the mystery was made known to me by revelation. As I have written briefly earlier, when you read this, you can understand my insight into the mystery of Christ, which was not made known to human beings in other generations, as it is now been revealed to his apostles and prophets by the Spirit that the Gentiles are co-heirs, members of the same body, and co-partners in promise in Jesus Christ through their gospel. Of this, I became a minister by the gift of God's grace that was granted me in accord with the exercise of his power. To me, the very least of holy ones, this grace was given to preach to the Gentiles the inscrutable riches of Christ and to bring to light for all what is the plan of the mystery, hidden from ages past in God who created all things, so that the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known through the church to the principalities and authorities in the heavens. This was according to the eternal purpose that he accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord in whom we have boldness of speech and confidence of access through faith in him. 
So I ask you not to lose heart over my afflictions for you. This is your glory. Praise be to God always. Hallelujah. He made him overseer of his house and put him in charge of all he had. Before the proclamation of the gospel of our Savior, announcing life for our souls, we offer this incense and ask for your mercy, O Lord. Peace be with you. From the Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to St. Matthew, who proclaim life to the world. Let us listen to the proclamation of life and salvation for our souls. You may silent the listener. The Holy Gospel is about to be proclaimed to you. Listen and give glory and thanks to the word of the living God. The Apostle Matthew writes, now this is how the origin of Jesus the Messiah came about. When his mother Mary was betrothed to Joseph, but before they lived together, she was found with child of the Holy Spirit. Joseph, her husband, as he was a righteous man, was yet unwilling to expose her to shame. He decided to separate from her quietly. Such was his intention when, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary, your wife, into your home. For it is through the Holy Spirit that this child has been conceived in her, and she shall bear a son, and you are to name him Jesus, because he shall save his people from their sins. All this took place in order to fulfill what the Lord had said to the prophet, Behold, the virgin shall be with child and bear a son, and they shall name him Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph awoke, he did as the angel of the Lord had commanded him, and he took his wife into his house. He had no relations with her till she bore a son, and he named him Jesus. This is the truth, peace be with you. Now the generation of the Messiah was in this manner. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. So confusion, we all know confusion at some point in our lives. Some more than others, but all of us at some point. And of course, confusion has that kind of idea when it's really profound of kind of bewilderment. We don't actually know where we're going or what we're doing. And what the word confusion in its origin actually means is pouring things together. That's why the word confound 
to be confounded, confusion. They're actually all the same origin, which in Latin is confundere, which means to pour things in together. That's why confusion has the idea of a jumble. And this is Joseph's predicament. The problem isn't the fact that, the problem with Joseph in this case is that he's too holy. And what he's been doing is considering, this is why St. Matthew points out the fact of his righteousness. And Joseph now with the absence of Mary, and surely she spoke of, because we're told in the very first line that before they came together, she was found, she was to be with the, holy, with the child, but of the Holy Spirit. When she's gone down to Ayin Karim for three months, Joseph has to think about now the second stage of marriage, because I've mentioned to you before, the marriages are done in two stages. One is the contract, the sanctification of it, the covenant, and they're considered married at that point. Which is why in these terms here, it's marry your wife, Joseph, her husband. They're already married. But in the interim, what you do then is the second stage is the party. And that's when you bring the bride from her parents' house and there's a huge party in the village and they bring her to her husband's house. So we're in between those two points. And Joseph, because Mary goes away to Ayin Karim, now has three months to think about this reality. That the child who's going to be born in your household is the Messiah. This is the Son of God. And this is part of his confusion because he's drawing in what's being poured into Joseph's head is the reality of what God is accomplishing through his wife. At the same time, because he is righteous and holy, these things mean something profound. He's not at all flattered by the fact. A lot of us probably just be flattered by the idea God's doing special things through me. But because of his holiness, he's overwhelmed by the idea of what this means to have the Messiah, the Son of God, in his household. That's his confusion. And so that's why it's said in the end, he just decides, well, we're not going to do this. She's in Jerusalem now. You know, there's family down there, of course. That's why she's visiting. We can just work kind of a discreet and keep us at where we're at now. She can stay with the family down there. And the priest, Zachariah, can foster and take care of the Messiah. This is Joseph's confusion. And then, of course, the angel appears to him and tells him, by his title, son of David, no, no, you take your wife into your house. That's why Joseph immediately changes and goes on to this. Now, we've often spoken about the fact that grace heals. Grace perfects nature. Grace elevates nature. And grace transforms nature. So as grace works in our lives, we're meant to be drawn forward in being healed, in being perfected of what we're supposed to be as human beings, but even more so what we're supposed to be as children of the kingdom, as children of God. And last week we spoke about the royal priesthood that is part of our baptism, what's given to us in our consecration. But it's important to understand when God works through grace, what he's doing in perfecting and elevating and healing nature and transforming it, he does this through the new creation. And the new creation is what is taking place actively in the historical reality that we call the church on earth. With all of the human blemishes and all of the human warts and all the human faults and sins that are there, the reality that is there for those, as our Lord says, those who have ears, let him hear those people are transformed within the church. But it's within the church that this transfiguration, this transformation takes place. Now I bring that up because of course it's important to remember that providence, what God accomplishes by grace, is not a form of magic. Grace takes place through beings, through contact, through created beings. God has chosen to reveal himself and to sanctify through the means of creatures, water, wine, bread, oil, words, and contact. This is what we see with Joseph with an angel that's sent. We're not told that God comes marching into the room. It's an angel who manifests. The spirit appears to him in his dream. 
and tells him the next step he needs to do in his path of perfection. And it's an important thing for us to remember because all of us, and when we mentioned last week this royal priesthood that the consecrated members of the church have through their baptism, that we are not only meant to be receivers of grace, we are meant to be agents of God's providence. We are meant to be agents and vehicles by which that grace that heals and transforms touches other lives. And this is the gift of prophecy. Now last week we talked about the priesthood that belongs to us by our chrismation and by our baptism, the ability to sanctify. We also talked about the kingship. So we combine those two by talking about the royal priesthood, of how we see creation around us, not limited within enclosed horizons, but shattered open by the kingdom. And the third aspect of our baptism and our chrismation is the office of our Lord of being prophet. Now, of course, this doesn't mean Ouija boards and telling the future and all these things and catastrophic books about the end of the world. That's not prophecy. Well, well, they call it prophecy. But when we talk about the fulfillment of baptism and chrismation, what takes place in us when the chrismation and baptism are done is we are metaphysically transformed within our very being. It's what we call the character in your catechism books. We are transformed to a very real way, whether we're in sin after that or in grace, that configuration will always remain of being conformed to the divine word forever, for eternity. It will be part of our glory within the kingdom or part of our shame and reprobation within the bowels of hell because it will always be seen that configuration that we have by the sacred character within our souls. It's that character which allows us to enter into and makes us part of that royal priesthood. It's also the ability that is given to us in the order of, in the office of prophecy. And we have to remember that in chrismation when it takes place, so in a few weeks time when we have the chrismation done for these young men, it's a very small ceremony. It's an imposition of hand. It's an anointing of the cross on the forehead with the sacred chrism. Very, very short, very simple. But it is the complete conferral. Imposition of hand within the church is always the aspect of a transfer of power and grace. And so when this takes place, it's not just simply that grace is being given and that the character transfigures the individual in chrismation. It also means that the Holy Spirit is given to the individual. God himself comes to this person. Too often, our, among, even among our faithful, not our faithful here necessarily, but in the Catholic Church, people will tend to talk about the Holy Spirit as if it's some kind of it, some kind of a force that kind of radiates out all around the place and every once in a while erupts in what we call sacraments. The Holy Spirit is the person of God. It's God himself who enters into us to communicate with us. So that when we speak about grace, that's a gift. But the gift with a capital G is God himself who enters into us, whose desire is to communicate the same way that when you have someone come to your home, they come to visit. And if that person sits there on their phone, you're in, rightly, insulted because they're not communicating. Why bother coming? But the same way that if you went to someone else's home as the visitor and they spent their time on their phone, you're thinking, well, what, the, what am I doing here? I'm wasting my time. Why did I even come here? She just ignores me. And that is what we understand that when the chrismation takes place and the Spirit of God, the person of God, comes to us his desire is to communicate. And if we spend our lives, as it were, on our phones, not listening to the presence of God within us, it has that same aspect of offense. That is the basis of prophecy, that God speaks to us to know the Holy Spirit and to be, to exist within the Holy Spirit. That is what is begun by baptism and chrismation. But that's only a beginning. It's a life that we have to develop through God's providence, through that grace, through that transformation that takes place 
by the presence of God. This is what, the deeper we enter into it, removes fear, removes anxiety. Because, of course, what does God want to communicate to us is exactly what he wants us to be doing in our lives. And if we're following that path, then we have no fear. We may be crucified. We may have all kinds of crosses given to us, just like our Lord Jesus had. But there is no fear because we know we're on the path of light of the kingdom. That is prophecy. That is the ability to know. This is why in this gospel, St. Matthew reminds us and tells us explicitly, it's the only place that we're told anything about Joseph, is this is an upright, just, righteous, holy man. This young man is before God completely upright and just. That's what St. Matthew is communicating to us. And as we mentioned to you last week and we considered the notion of Genesis and what was lost by original sin, so it is the same thing here. The office of prophecy is what we were created to be part of in the first place. In Genesis, it's portrayed rather poetically, kind of beautifully, but it talks about God walking through paradise in the, after, the cool of the afternoon. Now, obviously, God's not walking. He has no feet, he has no legs. But the portrayal is the intimacy within paradise with Adam and Eve, with humanity, that he communicates, and we're told that Adam heard the voice of God. That is prophecy. To be open to the intimacy of God's desire to communicate to us on a regular basis, not just Sunday morning, not just on occasion when we say the rosary or our daily prayers, but every moment of our lives. To have that intimacy that even in the afternoon air of paradise in the garden, that we hear the voice of God. That is prophecy. And so the rejection of Adam and Eve, the rejection of humanity in the beginning was, we don't want that incorporation of providence of this world, of transcendence and of transparency of the things around us. We want it for ourselves without reference to anything else that God wants us to do with it. That's what the demon means when he says to them, no, 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 you're not gonna die. You'll be like gods. That's why he doesn't want you to partake of this knowledge because he's jealous. And so what Adam and Eve do in that choice is they reject that voice of God and that plan of the kingdom to possess and to hold and to grasp onto the things of this world without reference to the voice of God. So it links with what we talked about last week of that enclosed horizon of the finality of this world. So that in the end, what we take place in the baptism, and in the Latin church, there used to be a ceremony called the Ephita. And during the baptismal preparation, the person to be baptized was touched on both ears. Ephita, which means be opened. And it's from the Gospels of our Lord healing a deaf man. And it signified that through baptism, our ears spiritually are open to hear that voice of God once again, like in paradise. It's not just a ceremony that went by in 15 seconds, but the signification of what takes place, to hear the voice of God, to discern the will of God within that voice, and then by that to become witnesses and agents of divine wisdom. That is prophecy. The word prophet in Greek only means spokesman. It doesn't mean telling the future. It doesn't mean doing anything else. It just means being a spokesperson for something, someone. And so prophetis, that's all it means. So that in hearing the voice of God, to discern the will of God, that we have become witnesses and testimony and agent of the divine wisdom. And that's why St. Paul will talk about sobriety. Now sobriety means to mean we don't drink alcohol. Sobriety in the term that St. Paul is talking about in the sobriety is this ability and it's the quality of true prophecy against pseudo-prophecy. Pseudo-prophecy are the Ouija boards, seances, uh, spiritual techniques, learning how to meditate before certain diagrams or whatever, spiritual techniques to make me spiritual. That's all pseudo-prophecy. 
To be a spokesman for God means we have a contact with the person of God who communicates to us his desire, which is our whole life. It's not just a moment, something we do on a Friday evening or a meditation method that we do for 10 minutes or half an hour each morning or whatever. It's not a technique, it's a life. And so when St. Paul talks about sobriety as being one of these characteristics of the presence of the Holy Spirit, it is precisely talking about the ability in my life to hear and to discern and to understand. So that the sole possibility of understanding God's creation when we link these two weeks together in the consideration of the gospel, that the only possibility for us truly to understand what God is doing in creating us and the world around us, to grasp reality in its totality, is this communication of prophecy is this communication of hearing the voice of God because it makes us capable to receive everything as coming from God and as everything leading us back to God. And without that spirit of prophecy, we lose our way. We become blinded to what God is actually doing in his providence and in the end we become confused because it's a jumble of things all around us and we don't know what we're doing. So in the end, what prophecy is doing, and we finish with this idea, prophecy is not a gift given to me or to you. Prophecy is meant to be what we are. Prophecy is the reintegration and the restoration of human nature, of each individual, the way we were originally created. Remember Adom, man being created in the garden, is supposed to hear the voice of God. That wasn't a special gift to Adam and Eve. It's what we're supposed to do as the children of God and children of the kingdom. So that in the spirit of prophecy, chrismation and baptism and the royal priesthood, it's the reintegration and the restoration of human nature in its vertical dimension. Last week, the royal priesthood is about a horizontal dimension. How do we deal with the creatures and the objects and the things around us and the events in our life? But prophecy is the reintegration of our vertical lives, how we relate to hearing the voice of the hidden one. And this is what our Lord means when he says that the truth will set you free. It's restorative, it's healing, it's elevating and transforming. But what it means is that we have to, as it were figuratively speaking, we have to put down the cell phones to be able in our daily lives to hear the voice of God. In other words, to learn how to control the distractions by the spirit of prophecy, rather than our distractions dulling out and deafening us to the voice of prophecy. And so it's that way of learning how to vertically relate to the creator and the hidden one so that we can find that truth which frees because it restores us, it heals us, and it reintegrates us. To hear the voice of God, to discern the will of God in every detail of my life, not just moments of crisis, but every moment of my life, so that in turn, in knowing and discerning the will of God, I can become that witness and that agent of providence by which grace will continue to spread in the world of the new creation. And that's why, quite beautifully, may God give us the grace to do it likewise as St. Joseph, that we're told that when he awoke from that dream, he immediately did everything that the angel had told him to do. That is prophecy. That is healing. And that is the dissipation of confusion because we have ears opened to hear the voice of light which brings us true life and freedom. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen.
We believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all things visible and invisible. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, his only begotten Son of God, born of the Father before all ages, God from God, light from light, true to God from true God, begotten. Telvot madeb hei da loho, walvot al loho da fari kanyu. Oegem sulvo taibu toho, keyu lel baita fresklo del chayet lo adbor shau. Lord in God, you accepted the offerings of our ancestors. Now we accept these offerings that your children have brought to you out of their love for you and for your holy name. Shower your spiritual blessings upon them, and in place of their earthly gifts, grant them life and your imperishable kingdom. Amen. As we remember our Lord God and Savior Jesus Christ and his plan of salvation for us, we recall upon this offering all those who have pleased God from Adam to this day, especially Mary, the Blessed Mother of God, Saint Joseph, her spouse, Saints Mary, Saint Jude, and Saint Charbel. Remember, O God, the children of the Holy Church, our fathers and mothers, and our brothers and sisters, both the living and the departed, especially those for whom the sacrifice is offered, for the intentions of all the members of this parish, especially for Barbara, Larry, and Rosanna. Remember also all those who share with us today in this offering.
Son and to the Holy Spirit now and forever. Amen. Lord God and Father, you are true love, security that is ever sure, and hope that never fails. Grant love, happiness, and everlasting peace to your children here before you. Make us worthy to give one another the greeting of peace with pure hearts and souls, and with the holy kiss worthy of your blessed name that we may raise glory to you, to your only Son, and to your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Peace to your holy altar of God. Peace to the holy mysteries placed upon you. Peace to you, O minister of God. Peace to you, O server of the Holy Spirit. Let each one of us give a greeting of peace to his neighbor with love and faith, which is pleasing to the Lord. As we bow before your majesty, send us your grace and glorious blessings from the heights of your heavenly sanctuary, that we may glorify you, your only Son, and your Holy Spirit forever. Amen. O Lord, you sent your beloved Son at the appointed time for our salvation, and he gave us these holy and life-giving mysteries. Do not look upon us as strangers, and do not turn your holy face away from us because of our many sins. For you alone are the Holy One, with your only Son and your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. The love of God the Father, and the grace of the only begotten Son, and the communion and indwelling of the Holy Spirit, 
be with you, my brothers and sisters, forever. And with your spirit, let us lift up our thoughts, our minds, and our hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord with reverence and worship him with humility. It is right and just to praise you, O Lord of all in heaven and on earth. The powers on high in the heavens where they dwell glorify you. The fiery ranks exalt you, the cherubim bless you, and the seraphim worship you. They cry out and they proclaim. Father, with your only Son, and your Holy Spirit, one and indivisible in nature, and you sanctify all things by your divine power. For our salvation, you sent your Son into the world. He descended, became flesh, suffered, and was crucified for us, who had distorted his image. Do this in memory of me, for whenever you eat this body and drink this blood, you proclaim my death until I come again. Christ our God, we remember your plan of salvation, and we implore your goodness. When you come in glory with your holy angels, and all await the reward they deserve. And when you place the sheep to the right, and the goats to the left, do not look upon us as strangers to your household, and do not turn your holy face away from us. Do not let our sins and offenses pierce your holy heart, and do not separate us from you. For we have professed your holy name and have proclaimed your divinity. 
Rather, treat us according to your promises. Forgive our sins, pardon us, and have mercy upon your inheritance. For this your repentant church implores you, and through you and with you implores your Father, saying, Have mercy on us, O O Lord, as we, your sinful children, receive your graces, we thank you for them and because of them. We praise you, we bless you, we adore you, we glorify you, we profess our faith in you and we ask you. Have compassion on us, O God, and mercy on us and hear us. How awesome is this moment, O my beloved! For the living Holy Spirit descends and rests upon this offering for our sanctification. Let us stand with reverence as we pray. Manin monio, manin monio, manin monio, nite mod rojo chayu kadisho. Unachen alainu ado korbo no hono. By his descent he may make this bread the body of Christ our God. Amen. And make the mixture in this chalice the blood of Christ our God. Amen. May these holy mysteries sanctify the bodies and souls of those who share in them, cleanse their hearts, purify their thoughts, and be a pledge of the heavenly kingdom and new life forever. Amen. O Lord, we now remember in this sacrifice all the holy churches and the shepherds of the true faith, especially Francis, the Pope of Rome, Bishara Peter, our Patriarch of Antioch, Gregory John, our Bishop, and all the bishops. With them we remember the priests, the deacons, and all who serve your church. We pray to you, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace and stability of the whole world, for a blessed and prosperous year, for an abundant harvest, for the sick and the oppressed, for all who call upon your holy name on land, at sea, or in the air, and who profess that you are the true God, we pray to you, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. Remember, O Lord, those who have presented the offerings upon this altar and those who desired to do so but were unable, and grant them their petitions. We pray to you, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. Remember, O Lord, your holy church that you established on the solid rock of the true faith and send her vocations to the holy priesthood and religious life. In a world of distractions which pull us away from properly loving you and our neighbor, may those whom you have called to serve your holy church respond to you and have the courage to follow your will. We pray to you, O Lord. Lord we remember all the saints, the fathers, prophets, apostles, martyrs, and confessors, Mary, the mother of God, St. Joseph, St. Jude, St. Marin, St. Charbel, and all the righteous and the just. Through their prayers, make us worthy to stand among them. We pray to you, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. Remember, O Lord, in your grace, those who have left us and have gone to you from the first Christian disciples to this day. They were signed with the seal of baptism and received the precious body and blood of your Son. They waned for you in your life, giving hope. Raise them up on the last day and in your mercy forgive all their sins. Through our Lord God and Savior Jesus Christ, who is without sin, we hope to find mercy and forgiveness for our sins and for theirs. Grant rest, O God, to the departed, and forgive the sins we have committed with a devoutful knowledge. Grant 
grant us pardon, O God, and forgive us and the departed, so that your blessed name may be glorified in us and in all things. With the name of our Lord Jesus Christ and of your living Holy Spirit, now and forever. God the Father, you accept prayers and answer petitions. You taught us through your beloved Son to stand before you and to call upon you with pure souls and clear consciences, praying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom and power and the glory of thy works, now and forever. Deliver us, O Lord, from every temptation and from harm of evil, for you have power over all. And we raise glory to you now and forever. Amen. Peace be with you. Bow your heads before the God of mercy, before his forgiving altar, and before the body and blood of our Savior, who gives life to those who partake of him and receive the blessing from the Lord. O Lord, in your grace and abundant mercy, bless those who bow before you. Make us worthy to share in your life-giving mysteries and to join the assembly of all your saints, that with them we may raise glory to you, to your only Son, and to your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. The grace of the Most Holy Trinity, eternal and consubstantial, be with you, my brothers and sisters, forever. And with your spirit. Let each one of us look to God with reverence and humility and ask him for mercy and compassion. Holy gifts for the holy, with perfection, purity, and sanctity. One, one Holy, holy Father, Father, one Holy Son, one Holy Spirit, blessed be the name of the Lord, for he is one in heaven and on earth, to him be glory forever. Make us worthy, O Lord God, so that our bodies may be sanctified by your holy blood, and our souls purified by your forgiving blood. May our communion be for the forgiveness of our sins and for new life, O Lord our
your body to eat and your living blood to drink. O lover of all people, have mercy on us.
Gracious God and Father, how can we repay you for your goodness, for the salvation you have just given us? Who can give you the glory you truly deserve? In our weakness, and insofar as we are able, we worship, praise, and thank you, your only Son, and your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Peace be with you. Jesus Christ, our God, we thank, worship, and praise you. We implore your goodness and abundant mercy for the salvation of the whole world, for the protection of the living and eternal rest for the departed, for the feeding of the hungry and the support of the needy, for the visiting of the sick and the consolation of the grieving. Through your grace dwell in them, and by your abundant mercy give them life. By your holy cross bless your people and protect your inheritance. Adoration is due to you, to your Father, and to your holy and life-giving Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Go in peace, my beloved brothers and sisters, with the nourishment and the blessings you have received from the forgiving altar of the Lord. May the blessing of the Most Holy Trinity accompany you, the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, the one God, to whom be glory forever.